Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, if you follow me on social media, you know that I just got back from eight fabulous days as a presenter and guest chef at Rancho La Puerta. And my guest today is one of the most popular speakers there who I actually met there. His name is Dr. Joseph Weiss. He's a prominent gastroenterologist, and today he is going to be talking about genes, diet, and health. Please welcome him back to the show. It's so nice to see you again, but I missed you at the ranch. Uh, thank you, AJ. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I am sorry I missed you at the ranch. So there is a lot of information I would like to share. I do have a PowerPoint presentation prepared because I like images. I think sometimes an image can share more information than words alone. The Topic today is genes, diet, and health. And I wanna preface by saying genes are critically important, but they are not your destiny. There is a lot more information that we know today about the importance of health and well being. And genes are important, but they are not your destiny. And I'll share why in just a moment. I also would like to comment about my background. I am a physician. I am a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Diego, but I like cartoons. And let's see if I can move to the next image. Here we go. Uh, a good friend of mine, Dan Ferraro, is a master syndicated cartoonist in the Bizarro cartoon strip. I think I might have been the inspiration for this. A boy is returning a G.I. Joe and it says, we wanted the army guy, not the gastroenterologist. Well, I'm... <laughs> A GI. I'm a gastroenterologist. We're known as GI for short. And my first name is Joe. So I'm a GI Joe. That makes it fairly easy. Now, I do want to share with everyone, I am absolutely fascinated by genetics and genomics and epigenetics. And it is a wildly interesting topic, but there is so much to share. And I don't want to scare anybody, but genes are critically important our understanding of the origins of life on earth. For those who are creationists, I do respect you. I have a great cartoon, which I'm not showing, where the finger of God is pointing and said, let there be evolution. So you can still be a creationist and accept evolution. On the bottom of this image, it says last universal common ancestor. That's over $4 billion, $4 billion. I'm thinking of financial now, 4 billion years ago. On earth, there was a single ancestor for all of us. We all evolved from this ancestor and over the billions of years, the ancestry has allowed differentiation to different species of life forms. We now have billions of different species living on planet earth. But if you look at the tree of life, every one of these species is related. You can do gene analysis and gene sequencing and identify how closely related we are to every other form of life on the planet. And the strange thing is that humans are related to plants, we're related to bacteria, we're related to viruses, we are all related. How closely we're related may be surprising to many. So when it comes to human genetics, we're about 99% identical to a chimpanzee, 60% identical to a banana or a fruit fly, 80% identical to a cow, 94% identical to a dog. From human to human, no matter what race or background, we are 99.9% .9 identical. There is a common language to all of genetics, and we all share this common language. It's the language of DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Now that's a multi-syllable word, and I apologize for even throwing it at you, but I think most have heard the initials DNA. It is the building block of all the information that's shared between ourselves and our descendants and across all species. There are only four letters in the DNA alphabet. If you take a look at the Hawaiian language, it has 16 different letters in its alphabet. In the alphabet of DNA, there are only four letters. But these four letters can spell a great deal of information because of the length of the DNA sequence. It goes in humans about 3 billion characters long. 
And DNA is amazing. It packs a tremendous amount of information. In the human, we have about 3 billion base pairs in our DNA, and that DNA is present in every one of our cells. We started off as a single cell organism, the fertilized egg. The egg divided, grew, and as we grew to an adult, from one cell, we now have 75 trillion cells. And again, that DNA provides the information for each of the cells to become specialized. The stem cells are the original cells, and you may have heard of stem cell therapy. That all goes back to all the information for every tissue in the human body is within the chromosomes, within the DNA. So when it comes down to it, it is a pretty wild story that the genome is the equivalent of a multi-volume instruction manual. Each chromosome is like a specific volume of the text. Each gene is like a chapter of information in the text. And again, the nucleotides, the four letters of the alphabet are key. If there's a mutation in one of the letters, things can go awry. Humans have about 20,000 genes. We are not the most populated species on earth in terms of the number of genes. There are many others, including plants, that have more genes than humans. Each of the genes has a specific role, and many of the roles are to code for the production of a protein, such as an enzyme, which is critical to human survival and survival of any species. So humans have about 20,000 genes. Fungi, the fungus, such as in mushrooms, have about 500,000 genes. Bacteria, which are everywhere, and I've given another talk on the gut microbiome, which are the microbial life forms which live within the gut, has well over 8 million genes. What I'm getting at is our 20,000 genes are outnumbered by all the other genes surrounding us. One important point to remember is that the foods we eat and the foods we require for nutrition also contain genes. So there are over 22,000 genes in a cow, over 20,000 in a sheep, 21,000 in a pig, up to 50,000 in a fish. The number of genes pretty striking, 57,000 genes in an apple. And I mentioned earlier how all life on the planet is related and how we now have over a billion different species of life forms. Many of these species are foods that we eat and consume. We are exposed to the genes of the foods that we eat. So not only are we receiving nutritional value, and you may think of the macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. You may think of the micronutrients, minerals, vitamins, et cetera. But we're also exposed to and receiving the genes from the different foods that we are eating. And as I'll share with you in a moment, these genes influence our health and well being. There is new sciences that have developed with advances in our understanding within the life sciences. There is a new field called nutrigenetics, which talks about the genetic variability between people and how it affects our metabolism of nutrients. Nutrigenomics are the effects of the dietary components on the genes themselves. The foods we eat can influence, and they do influence, our genes. There's also nutritional epigenomics. Well, I don't want to bore you with all the new sciences, but I do want to share that it is really important to understand that the food and nutrients we eat and we require for our life and well-being, many of their beneficial as well as potentially harmful effects are based on genes. So nutrigenetics are how genes affect our response, our body's response to food nutrigenomics, and how the foods we eat influence the human genes. There have been tremendous changes over time in foods. If you think of the life forms on planet Earth, all arising from a last uniform common ancestor known by the acronym LUCA, and again, humans and bacteria, 30% of our genes are identical. 
from the very beginning of life, genetic modification has been taking place. GMO, genetically modified organisms are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They have traditionally been established through farming and through crossbreeding. Now we tend to restrict the term GMO to genetic modification using non-natural means, artificial gene sequencing, if you would. But if you take a look at what we have accomplished over the years, just from crossbreeding from farmers from thousands of years ago, the peach is much, much larger than it had been just a few thousand years ago. The chicken has changed dramatically over the last few decades. It has grown dramatically because of gene modification. One of the most surprising findings in genetics is that genes are not just inherited from your parents. That was known as the vertical transmission of genes. You would get genes from your parents, grandparents, great grandparents, you pass it on to your kids, et cetera. We now know there's a whole new concept and it was described and identified by Dr. Barbara McClintock who got the Nobel prize in medicine about 40 years ago for her identification of jumping genes, also known as the horizontal transfer of genes. This occurs routinely throughout nature, more common in bacteria and microscopic life forms, but it occurs in larger animals as well. This is where a gene can be transferred to a completely different species. It doesn't even have to be from an ancestor. It can be from a completely different form of life, genes can be transferred, which is what I'm going to come back to in just a moment about why the genes in the food are also critically important to your health and well-being. Some of you may have heard of a new technology that's been making the news called CRISPR. CRISPR is advanced genomic gene transfer. However, it's been around for millions of years. It's making the news now only because it's been recently discovered but it's been present in microbes for millions, if not billions of years. This is leading to a whole new advance in the life sciences, including medicine. Fortunately, the advances can really help people. We now have the ability to cure hereditary diseases such as hemophilia, hereditary blindness are now being cured today using this technology, which was first identified in microbes. It will also revolutionize the food sciences. So for those who are concerned about GMO, guess what, folks? It's going to get much more interesting yet because of the advances in technology. We're at the point now where genes can be switched between completely different species of life. I also want to comment about how complex and complicated humans are. And it's not just humans. Every form of life is extraordinarily complex. I mentioned in the human, we started off as a single cell from the fertilized egg, and now we have about 35 plus trillion cells. Within each cell, there are millions of different proteins and enzymes and metabolites, and there are billions of chemical reactions that occur every second while we are alive that is maintaining our physiology, our health and well-being. So it's astronomical numbers of actions occurring in trillions of cells. The bottom line is to survive and to maintain our life, we must obtain nutrition. Many people think of nutrition as simply the macronutrients, such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, or the micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, etc. But don't forget that air, oxygen, is also a nutrient. Water is also a nutrient. We require all these nutrients to live. The volume and astronomical number of reactions occurring within our bodies every single second require a significant intake of nutrients to survive. Many people can survive for a few moments without air. I think the record for breath holding is about 25 minutes, and that's pretty remarkable. Most people can't live more than a few minutes without oxygen or air. For water, it can range from a few days to a week or two without water. When it comes to food, we can last for several weeks. <clears throat> On average, about two to three weeks without water is possible. 
I'm sorry, without food is possible. But for those who are obese, you can last even longer without food. The good news for those who are overweight, and I was overweight, we'll talk about that at the very end of the program, is that the extra pound of weight that you have can give you an extra two-day cushion of starvation time without food. You can live off of the excess calories that you have stored in your body. So people can live for several weeks to several months without food, but you can only live for a few days to a week or two without water and just a few moments without air. The diet, the nutrients that we require is at the top of this slide. The top point says diet. The caption above the figure says environmental epigenetic influences. The term epigenetic is important. You remember a bit of a tease during grade school, your epidermis is showing, your epidermis is showing, that is the outer layer of your skin is showing. Genetics are important, but I mentioned your genes are not your destiny for a very important reason. There is now a new science known as epigenetics. That is the epigenetic influences really have the most important influence on our outcome. We may have a specific gene, but that gene will be modified by environmental influences. Diet is the, at the top. So even though you may harbor a specific gene, your diet can change the presence and how that gene expresses itself. Seasons, the weather, uh, diseases, uh, smoking, drug use, financial, exercise, uh, state of your gut, the gut microbiome, uh, medication, social contact, uh, the state of your mind, psychology, all of these play a role and influence our genes. So while genes are important, 95% of them are under significant epigenetic influence. Your diet, exercise, your mind, etc., can change your genes. Only about 5% of genes are called fully penetrant, and those are now amenable to CRISPR and other advanced technologies. The best example of epigenetics I can think of is this image. This is a caterpillar on the left. And when it enters into it, by the way, a caterpillar, if it becomes a butterfly, does not enter into a cocoon. I love sharing trivia with folks. For a butterfly, it enters into what is called a chrysalis. If it goes into a cocoon, that's for a moth. For a butterfly, it's a chrysalis. Sorry, kids, I just want to share some trivia with you. So when the caterpillar goes into the chrysalis and comes out as a butterfly, its DNA sequence, its genetics is identical. The genes have not changed at all. But what has changed are the epigenetic influences. The genes are identical, it's the epigenetics that changed. And look at the difference in appearance. From crawling on a leaf to flying through the air, this is the power of epigenetics. And again, diet is one of the most important influencers on our epigenetics. Exercise would be number two. I like this quote from Wendell Berry. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. As a physician, this is really embarrassing, but unfortunately still true. We are making progress, but we have a long way to go to recognize how important food and nutrition is to our overall health. And what's particularly embarrassing is this has been known for a long time. Even Hippocrates 2,500 years ago made a comment that our food is our medicine. Our medicine is our food. So when you look at the purpose of nutrition, and it is required for life, we do require nutrition. It is to provide energy. It also regulates the body processes. It's also needed for the maintenance, repair, and growth of the body. Remember, you start off as a single, nearly microscopic egg cell that was fertilized, one single cell. And look at where we are now at 35 trillion plus cells. We're very visible. Some of us are more visible than others. I was more visible. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. The six essential nutrients are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water. And actually, oxygen should be listed as a seventh essential nutrient. We require all of these. 
When it comes to the diet, by the way, the term diet is from a Greek word, diata, which means a way of life. Most Americans don't follow a diet. Unfortunately, most Americans are on the standard American diet, which is devastating. It is known by the acronym SAD, S-A-D for Standard American Diet. And unfortunately, it is mainly processed foods and animal products. Only 15% are actually the foods that would be to our advantage to consume, the fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, etc. So the standard American diet, which is prevalent, leads to standard American diseases. Over 75% of the American population is presently overweight or obese, and it leads to devastating consequences. When we tell people you're best off having a whole plant-based diet, plant-based foods are better for you, the typical response is I need meat to get protein. Sorry, folks, you don't need meat. In fact, all of the essential amino acids, all of the nutrients are available in plant-based form. You do not need to eat meat. In fact, many vegetables have more protein per portion size or per gram than meat does. And I don't want to scare you, but unfortunately, meat is not what you think it is today with commercial ranching and farming you're being exposed to antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, herbicides, all sorts of toxins. Even the organic cattle ranch is not quite as good as you might think it is. So I would encourage you to consider reducing, particularly red meat consumption, increasing protein intake in plant-based form. The other thing that's really interesting and has revolutionized our understanding of health from the digestive aspect and gastroenterology and all the life sciences is not only that the diet and food contain genes which influence our health and well-being through the epigenetic influence, they also influence the gut microbiome. Microbiome are the life forms that are microscopic in size that you cannot see with the naked eye. The microbiome has different locations. There's the gut microbiome, which I've mentioned within the gut, there's also a skin microbiome. There's a microbiome everywhere around the world, everywhere. They've done experiments where they've taken areas out in the ocean where you're not exposed to any landforms. It's just the air, it's just ocean air. And they're able to identify that there are millions of microbial life forms landing on whatever plate you put out in the middle of a deck on a cruise ship from the ocean air itself. There are microbes everywhere in enormous quantities. The gut microbiome is now considered a human organ system. It's the only human organ system that is not human. These are microbes. These are alien beings that live within us, but they are part of the human superorganism. We require them. We need them to survive. There are symbionts. There is a symbiosis between humans and the microbes residing in the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is changing our understanding of a variety of diseases. Virtually every disease is now recognized as being influenced by the gut microbiome. This includes Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, arthritis, cancers, etc. What is uniquely increasingly understood is that everything is interrelated. Just like the microbiome is interrelated with our health and well being. The foods that we eat interrelate with the microbiome. They change the microbiome. The microbiome is influenced by our diet. Our diet influences our microbiome. The diet and microbiome influence the human. So our health and well being is intimately intertwined with the microbiome and with diet and nutrition. And the underlying principle of genetics comes across all three. So let me give you just one example of how things get really interesting. You may recall that for years, there's always been controversy. Are eating egg yolks good for you or bad for you? If you're reading the newspapers or magazines every few years, the verdict would change. Egg yolks are bad for you. Egg yolks are good for you. What is going on? The reason it's confusing is because the research that has been done has come up with conflicting answers. I like cartoons. Good news, your cholesterol has stayed the same 
but the research findings have changed. Well, when it comes to egg yolks, whether it's good for you or bad for you, we now understand why the research data was all over the place. It was not consistent. It was in conflict more often than not because they were not looking at one important variable, which was the gut microbiome. None of the scientists were checking the gut microbes to see if that had any influence. And it has every influence. So when you eat an egg, which has choline, or if you have a steak, which has carnitine, it's the gut microbes that metabolize, that help with the digestion. In this case, if you have carnitine or choline, and choline again from the egg yolks, carnitine from the meat, if you harbor the microbes that convert the choline and carnitine to a different compound. They convert it to a compound called trimethylamine. In the liver is converted to trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. That compound, that metabolite leads to atherosclerosis and heart disease. So if you have the microbes that convert the choline and carnitine to TMAO, you're in trouble. You're at risk for heart disease if you do not have that microbe, you can eat all the egg yolks you want and meat is safer for you. It doesn't lead to the same effect. So the reason the data was all over the place that egg yolks are good for you or bad for you is because no one was looking to see what microbes are present. And now we know it's not the food itself, it's the microbes and their digestion and metabolism of the food that makes a big difference. And let me give you another example. I hope you know that cruciferous vegetables are good for you. They actually help protect you from various cancers. But what you may not know is it gets just a bit more complicated. Just like there are food sciences, there is food biochemistry. In the cruciferous vegetables, I don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings, but the cauliflower and broccoli were not planning on protecting you from cancer when they develop the system within their cells. Within the plant cells of the cruciferous vegetables are two vacuoles, little storage cells that contain two different compounds. One is called a glucosinolate. The other one is an enzyme called myrosinase. If a pest such as a caterpillar, which we saw earlier, chomps through the leaf of a cruciferous vegetable, it crushes the cell, releases the two chemicals which interact and they form a new chemical, sulforaphane. That chemical, sulforaphane, is a pesticide. The cruciferous vegetables did this on purpose to protect themselves against these pests. So when the pest crushes through the cell, releases the two chemicals, they convert it to sulforaphane, which eliminates the pest. Brilliant. It just so happens that sulforaphane prevents cancer in humans. Oh, it makes sense, doesn't it? We should eat cruciferous vegetables. But here's a take-home point, which is just a little bit intriguing. There are two parts to the cell that are crunched, crushed, released, that convert to, glu to the sulforaphane. The glucosinolase requires the enzyme myrosin. If you don't crush the cell first and you cook it, something goes wrong here. The glucosinolate is heat stable. You can cook it all you want, the glucosinolate stays active. But the myrosin cell, the myrosinase, is heat labile. If you cook it, it is inactivated. So if you cook your broccoli and cauliflower, you're gonna have plenty of the glucosinolate, but without the enzyme, it's not converted to the chemical compound you really want that would protect you against cancer, the sulforaphane. So the trick is you have to puree or crush the cells first to release these two chemicals to convert it to sulforaphane, which is heat stable. Once the glucosinolate and myrosinase interact and convert to the sulforaphane, you can cook it all you want, you're gonna get the benefits. If you think about this, you know what, they've already sauteed the broccoli and they've sauteed the cauliflower or whatever, you've lost some of the benefits. So the way around that is to have a bite of raw broccoli or cauliflower along with it. You don't need a lot of the enzyme and you'll be able to activate all of the glucosinolate within the plant. So it may sound a little bit complex, but the bottom line is have a bite of a raw cruciferous vegetable along with a saute or puree, crush, crunch the vegetable before you cook it. That allows the chemicals to interact. 
Or what you could also do is add mustard to your cauliflower, broccoli, kale, et cetera. But here's the trick. Do not use a prepared mustard that is in a container. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feeling from Grey Poupon or from uh, Heinz or from uh, French's. Once those are processed, they're pasteurized, the myrosin in the mustard is inactivated. You need to have raw mustard seed. And that allows the conversion to the metabolite that you do want that can protect you from cancers. Many people are convinced probiotics are fantastic and they are all the rage. I have a bias. I would suggest be careful probiotics. I would consider them the way you think of an antibiotic. They change the gut microbiome and not always for the better. The evidence today suggests that the more diverse your microbiome, the healthier you will be. We do know that taking even a single dose of an antibiotic can harm your gut microbiome and the harm can be present and noted for up to two years after even a single dose of an antibiotic. A probiotic can also harm your microbiome by eliminating beneficial microbes. It kills them, not the way an antibiotic does chemically, it kills them by crowding them out, starving them out, pushing them out. There's only room for so many microbes within the gut. The problem is that the commercial probiotic products, and they are out there, and it's an over $5 billion a year marketplace, typically have one, two, three, or four microbes that they encourage you to take. They have billions of colony forming units. They want you to take their product every day for the rest of your life or until your bank account is dry, whichever comes first. But if you wanna have a diversity of microbes, you don't want four or five different microbes like they're packaging in the probiotic commercial preparations. You want hundreds of thousands of different microbes and different species of microbes. And you'll get that from food. I would encourage you to go to your organic markets or farmer's markets. The more variety of fruits and vegetables you eat, the, reach, the richer your gut microbiome will be. We also know that fermented foods are very rich in the probiotics that you would want. I would suggest saving your money from the commercial probiotics and using it to buy food, a diversity of food, a variety of foods. The healthier the source of the foods, the healthier your microbiome. And again, you're gonna be exposed to more genes which are beneficial. So let me summarize again, 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates had it right. Our food should be our medicine. Our medicine should be our food. I'd like to end with just a few bite-sized clinical pearls. If you are interested in losing weight, preload with water such as soup, eat low calorie density foods. Stay away from the high calorie density foods. Select high nutrient density foods. Start each meal with a salad and including bright colors. They are rich in the antioxidants and the phytochemicals. Eat whole fruits, not the juices. Chew your foods well. Enjoy a meal without a rush. Record your weight daily if you wanna keep track of your weight, that's reasonable. And there should be a time window for eating. There's growing evidence that intermittent fasting can be really beneficial, but you can take advantage of the overnight fast. When you have breakfast in the morning, it's called breakfast for a reason. You're breaking the fast. You're already fasting for six, seven, eight hours. If you have no food after 7 p.m., you're extending that fasting period. If you have your breakfast delayed, you're extending the fasting period. There are all sorts of benefits to intermittent fasting by entering into a fasting state. It moves from the sugar-based model to the ketone base you end up increasing autophagy, which is a cell house cleaning, if you would. So there is an advantage to intermittent fasting and continuing on, avoid processed foods, avoid artificial sweeteners. If you choose another sweetener, uh, a natural products such as stevia or monk fruit is preferable. Reduce salt, oil, and sugar. Prebiotic fiber to support the gut microbiome. Fermented foods such as uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, yogurt, um, kefir, all are beneficial. By the way, if you're going to have sauerkraut, don't go to the, the non-refrigerated glass pasteurized sauerkraut that has no probiotic quantities at all. It's been pasteurized. All the microbes have been killed. You want to go to the refrigerated section or make your own foods. Make your own kumbacha if you want. Avoid antibiotic overuse, mindful eating without distractions adequate high quality sleep, avoid charred broiled foods and great food. If it's a real plant, not from a factory plant, 
words of wisdom from a Tibetan proverb, the secret to living well and longer is eat half, walk double, laugh triple, and love without measure, Tibetan proverb. And the last words of wisdom, again, from Tibet, from the Dalai Lama, when asked what surprised him most about humanity, answered man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health, and then he is so anxious about the future, he does not enjoy the present, the result being that he does not live in the present or the future, he lives as if he is never going to die, and then dies having never really lived. I hope that you found this interesting and helpful. I will be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm gonna hit stop share. I also wanna share with you that there is less of me than there was before. I've lost about 65 pounds over the last few months, painlessly, and I like to share credit where credit is due. Uh, I like my spousette, Nancy, who is also positioned to come up and join me here. Nancy, if you would join me for just a moment. She is a Gynecologist, I see that she is my personal gynecologist. She's not a <laughs> really endocrinologist, and she is my much better half, uh, Dr. Nancy Sattel. Well, Hi, welcome. AJ. Oh my God, that was a fabulous presentation, and it's exactly spot on with everything all the plant based doctors I work with uh, agree with. And it's wonderful to hear that our DNA is not our destiny. It is not. And most people are confused, and genetics does sound intimidating. But once you understand it, it is mind-bogglingly beautiful. It's absolutely brilliant how we're able to transmit information to the next generation, how we can modify our health and well-being, and how much remains in our control. Yes, we've inherited these genes, but you can modify, you can manipulate them. It's amazing what you can do with diet, exercise, and other lifestyles. It's, a, it's like Dr. Colin Campbell once said, genetics loads the gun, but it's our diet and lifestyle that pulls the trigger and our diet, whether or not we exercise, that is within our control. Absolutely. It really is within our control. And it's, wow. also, yeah, it's also what we feed our mind every day, not just our, not just our body, but what we feed our mind, what we tell ourselves. And sometimes we tell ourselves stories that aren't even healthy for us. So having the right mindset goes along with having the right set of knowledge so that you can nourish yourself in the right way. I think that's that's wonderfully color coordinated, I might add. Oh, thank thank you. I don't even notice that. But I think it's also important what Nancy brings up. Although I mentioned that diet and exercise are two of the key epigenetic factors, think about what else is an epigenetic influence. Your mind, psychology, social activity, faith, beliefs, meditation, uh, financial status. Um, there are so many other exposures that influence our genetics and our genomics and influence our destiny. So do not underestimate the power within your own hands and the power within our own mouths, if you would. So 60 pounds, that's tremendous. There's less of you to love. So how did oh, you do thank that? Thank you. Thank you. There's less of me to be annoying too, but I, uh, I have to say it was absolutely painless. And I think a lot of it was inspired by you, Chef AJ. And Nancy's been watching your program regularly and learned a lot from you, which we all have, which we really appreciate. But she has found it uh, possible to retrain me to understand and recognize that the value and beauty and taste of food has nothing to do with some of the other um, items that I was uh, fascinated by and maybe somewhat addicted to. And I think that's also another important point. There is a whole industry out there from food psychologists and food manufacturers which are influencing our consumption. And it is a business, it is profit driven. They have mastered the science of getting people to uh, consume enormous quantities of unhealthy products because it's better for their bottom line. Our bottom line is we should do what's healthy and best for us. So at times we have to go against the grain of what the marketers are selling us. But there is a science to food psychology, and I'm sure you're well aware of it. They've done experiments where they put a bowl of soup in front of someone where there's a small little tube that is refilling the bowl without them notice, and they're going to eat two to three times as much as they otherwise would. And foods have become addictive, and they are harmful for us. And yet the beauty and the taste and the vibrancy and the colors, I didn't miss a beat with the diet that Nancy modified for me. And the weight transition, transition transformed. transformed, but the weight loss was seamless, painless. I was absolutely satiated, delicious food, 
Um, it was a piece of cake. Oh, no, that's the wrong thing to say. But it was easy. <laughs> piece of kale, a piece of kale. It was <laughs> there a you piece go. of kale, absolutely, and, bro <laughs> well and, and broccoli. Well but, but only a piece of broccoli if you ate it with mustard or a piece of raw broccoli first. That's right. And mustard seed preferable. Remember, the pasteurized mustard no longer has active myrosinase. So sometimes food biochemistry has practical value. If you know about it, it makes sense, and you can really protect your own health. I love that you mentioned calorie density because that's basically what I teach, you know? Absolutely. You, yeah. that, that, that is a core value. And, and um, I, I appreciate also your cooking demos. And so now I would say that um, I start the day in our, in our home with, I say, full steam ahead. And what that <laughs> means is I will take a variety of, of organic vegetables and I will start steaming them. I don't have a pressure cooker, but I... I use a Cuisinart steamer, a small one, and then I have a nice foundation of veggies to use in whatever way I want. Also important was learning to incorporate more of the healthy um, starches and including rice, including the potatoes. We, you know, Joe always enjoys eating and to feeling satisfied and satiated. So really important to have the flavor there using herbs and, and also enough of the um, nutritious dense foods and we make a blend he is always full and satisfied and never is complaining oh what am I going to eat so full steam ahead and then I run what I call an improv kitchen because I too like you you say you're not following recipes well I get some inspiration from recipes and I learn hints and, and tips but I will look at what I have on hand and I will improvise and so Every day there's something new and creative and I always try to make it attractive looking as well. So, you know, it's fun and tasty. And although he said he lost that weight in a few months, no, it was really over, over the span of a year or more and it was sustainable uh, and natural. I love it. Well, you look great, Dr. Joe. Because hey, I, mean, I saw you when you were heavier. So I know it's true what you're saying. Yes, I, know, I feel better and uh, it's nothing like being healthy and not having to pay a price for it in terms of uh, deprivation. There was no deprivation at all. It was absolutely painless. And your microbiome is probably happy with all the uh, sure variety of healthier. plants. I'm um, sure it's absolutely healthier. That is fantastic. Well, you know, we actually have a question about the microbiome. Sure, Somebody please. took, I guess, um, some, okay. So Kathleen said, when I tested positive for COVID, I took Paxlovid. 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 Thank you. Paxlovid. Thank you. I think part of being a doctor is being able to pronounce words that are spelled weird. I oh, think that you can do that. You can get through medical school. And she says, uh, what does this drug and COVID do to one's gut microbiome? That's an excellent question. Without a doubt, the drug and COVID influence and change your gut microbiome. The good news is your microbiome will bounce back. You're obviously not going to be on the Paxlovid forever, and hopefully you will no longer harbor the COVID virus. So your microbiome will come back, but your microbiome changes all the time. It changes with every single meal, every time you travel, every time you change your water source, any new drug, your microbiome is changing. The microbiome has over 100 trillion organisms. And it typically has thousands to tens of thousands of different species. And the numbers are changing all the time. And to make things just a bit more complex, your gut microbiome is not just one entity that is standard throughout the gut. It changes every single millimeter that you move down the length of the gut. The gut is a long, hollow tube that runs from the mouth to the anus. It's about 30 some feet long. Every millimeter, the microbes that are residing with the gut are changing in populations and changing in diversity. So if you think about it, it is one enormously complex interactive system that is interacting with your diet, with your medicine, activities, exercise, social networking. When you're in a room with other people, you're being exposed to their microbes as well. It's being transferred all the time. So there is no simple answer. We are getting more and more information as the science is evolving. There is more and more research being done associating specific microbes with various conditions. And there will be specific probiotics coming in the future. We're not there yet, where they will modify the gut microbiome 
to help reduce the risk of certain conditions or to treat certain conditions. One of the most popular areas now is we recognize that diet is very much a part of our mood and psychological well being and our mental status. And there are the new class of probiotics that will be called psychobiotics, where they are microbes that generate more of the neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, GABA, et cetera. The microbes generate them. One of the most intriguing findings was that many of the popular prescription drugs called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you may know them by the brand names of Prozac, Paxil, Vexor, et cetera. They were initially thought to work on the brain to increase the serotonin content. We now know that of all the serotonin in the human body, only 5% of the serotonin is in the brain. 95% is in the gut. And the serotonin in the gut is triggered by the gut microbiome. They influence the cells within the gut lining to produce more serotonin. So it's the microbes. And now we found that Prozac, Paxil, Effexor, all the SSRIs work not on the brain. They work not just on the gut, they work on the gut microbiome. So everything in the life sciences is being turned upside down as we learn more and more. So great question. Unfortunately, yes, there is an impact. There is an influence. The good news is it's temporary. You will go back and hopefully improve your gut microbiome and you can improve your gut microbiome. Great. You know, we know that sugar is not good for us, but I appreciate you mentioning that artificial sweeteners really aren't either for losing weight or for our microbiome. What people don't realize that artificial sweeteners are basically are chemicals and every chemical has a consequence. We now know that the artificial sweeteners, which have become so popular, actually act as antibiotics on the gut microbiome and they will change the gut microbiome in unhealthy ways. And there are unintended consequences. There is so much that we don't know. And most people have no clue how ignorant we are in medicine and the life sciences, how there is so much more yet to be discovered. We are just scratching the surface and there will be much more to be found. And then we'll have insights. And now it's the microbiome that's revolutionizing the life sciences. And now it's gonna be genomics, epigenetics, nutrigenetics, nutrigenomics. There are whole new disciplines yet to be discovered, yet to be uncovered. Uh, and there will be more information coming but there is an awful lot we do not know yet. And the de most dangerous part is the stuff that we do not know that we do not know. Many people think we know it all and not even close. Great, thanks. So when I use, let's say one of your recipes for making something sweet, like a shake, I'll, I'll add some dates to add natural sweetness, try, trying to avoid the artificial sweeteners. Absolutely. There's so, I mean, anything you, I mean, not you, but anything one can do with sugar, I think you can do with dates beautifully. And then you get all the beautiful fiber because you had mentioned that most people are eating most of their calories from animal products and processed food. Neither of those categories have fiber. And you do need fiber. And the fiber is now being relabeled as a prebiotic. The fiber is nutrition that the microbes need. So what the commercial companies are out there doing now is they're producing prebiotics. It's basically fiber. They've changed it from fiber to prebiotic and they've doubled and tripled the price because they can do it. So it's a prebiotic now, but it's basically the same thing. You do need fiber, soluble and insoluble fiber. It's a very important component of our diet and our nutrients. It also adds to satiety, uh, it has all sorts of benefits to it. So yes, we are deficient in fiber. The typical American has only a fraction of the fiber intake that they really should have. Right. I, I mean, people worry about where we get our protein. I worry about where most people are getting their fiber because they're not. They're not getting it. It's very, very uh, true. And there absolutely. are consequences to that. It's a deficiency that we are paying through well, the colon, nose and through the pocketbook. Cancer. Well, yeah. colon cancer is just one. I'm a gastroenterologist and colon cancer is just one area. And that's a Policy. devastating disease. And there are so many others from cardiovascular disease. Fiber is critical. And if you think about fiber as being the basis of our understanding of the microbiome. And now we understand the microbiome is associated with every disease. There is not one disease that is not influenced by the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome needs fiber. That's what it lives on. Absolutely. Are you familiar with the book Fiber Fueled by any chance by Dr. Will Bolshevitz? I've, I've not yes. read it, but yes. I've seen it. And Nancy has it. So yes. yes. Yeah. Because I mean, fiber is king. It really is. <laughs> it, it is. And it's amazing how you can have it in the most palatable forms. It really should not influence your 
your taste buds in any way and it adds satiety. So fiber has real benefit. Instead, yep, so of, more, instead of the oh. campaign got milk, it should be got fiber. Yes, I agree. I agree. Oh my God. That's I have a, I have a t-shirt that says fiber is the new protein. So Mona, who's watching live says, I wish they were my doctors. Are either of you in practicing anymore? Can, can you see patients? Uh, we do not see individual patients except on a very, very limited basis. As you know, we travel to spas and resorts. And when we're there, we will see people for individual private consultations. We're not treating people as prescribing doctors. We tend to More consider as ourselves as consultants, as a, uh, health, as advocate. a health advocate and a guide. And we think that's a very valuable service that we can provide and we're happy to do that. That's fantastic. So uh, psychobiotics, somebody's asking, what are those? Well, psychobiotics are a group of probiotics that are known to influence your mental health and well-being. At the moment, they are not being marketed, but they will, but you can bet that industry is going to jump on this bandwagon. The science is still processing the information as which are the microbes, specific species and strains that are most likely to increase some of the neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, gamma amino butyric acid, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, et cetera. It's these microbes that influence the milieu of the hormones and neurotransmitters that will impact the mind as well as the body. And they are now known as psychobiotics. These are living organisms that influence the chemicals that deal with our mood and psychological well-being. And one, right. of, them, one of them is called dark chocolate. Phenyl ethyl alanine also is a mood enhancer, but in very small bites. <laughs> very cool. enough, chocolate is actually a fairly nutritious food. It is rich in antioxidants and it, it does have probiotic qualities as well. So dark chocolate has some advantages, which I'm happy to say and share with everyone. Nice. Well, people love to hear that. Uh, Susan uh, Sharon says, you mentioned kefir. Why is it beneficial and how should we get it and how often? Well, kefir is beneficial, and some of the research looks at a condition, and I don't mean to intimidate anyone with a long-term name for an illness, but I'll share it with you. It's called pseudomembranous colitis, also known as antibiotic-associated colitis. For those who know, people who are on antibiotic, because the antibiotic kills off the normal gut microbiome, may end up with a harmful microbe that takes home, and that microbe can cause, by the way, it's got a fancy name, it's called Clostridia difficile, that's the name of the microbe, causes a horrendous inflammatory diarrheal condition, which can be life-threatening and people can die from it. We do know now that if you are gonna take an antibiotic, you are better off taking a probiotic, specifically yogurt, and the best one of all is kefir. If you were to take kefir about a day or two before you start antibiotic, continue with the kefir three or four times a day during the course of the antibiotic and continue for about a week after, you have a much lower risk of coming down with this life-threatening condition called pseudomembranous colitis or antibiotic-associated colitis. So kefir is much like a yogurt, it's a fermented food, it's got lactobacillus, it has beneficial properties, and strangely enough, it is the treatment of choice to prevent this life-threatening condition. That's great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jesse says, so what are your thoughts on GERD? Avoid it if you can. <laughs> Absolutely. GERD is very, very common. Uh, GERD is an acronym, G-E-R-D, stands for gastroesophageal <laughs> reflux disease. It's very, very common. People who have heartburn, uh, reflux, regurgitation, those are the typical signs of GERD. But keep in mind, GERD has other presentations. It's a, a great mimicker. It can also cause voice loss, laryngitis, mm -hmm. dental caries, loss of tooth enamel, sinusitis, um, ear problems. Uh, GERD can have atypical chest pains. It can mimic a heart attack. It can cause bronchitis, asthma. So what GERD is, it's acid, food content, bile coming up from the stomach into the esophagus and on occasion going further north. And that's why it leads to all the complications, including pneumonia, asthma and bronchitis, et cetera. It's very, very common. Many people, about half the population over 50, have what is called a hiatal hernia. 
That term comes from the diaphragmatic hiatus. That's the opening between the chest and the abdominal cavities where the diaphragm has an opening for the esophagus to enter into the stomach. A hernia is where one organ slides through another. This is where the stomach begins to slide up above the diaphragm and that can predispose to reflux. So if you have heartburn, small amounts, once every couple of weeks, okay. If it's a week or more, you should talk to your healthcare provider about it. There are ways to reduce it. The best way is lifestyle modification. So rather than eating late at night and then lying down recumbent, have a period of time where you're upright after your last meal before you lie down. Have a wedge pillow under your head or raise the head of the bed so you have a little bit of gravity keeping material out of your esophagus away from the damage that it will cause. The scary part about reflux is people who have chronic reflux have a higher risk of a condition called Barrett's esophagus, named after Dr. Barrett. This is where the inflammation from the acid and the bile irritating the lower esophagus changes the cells lining the lower esophagus from a normal squamous flat cell to a thickened columnar gastric type cell called intestinal metaplasia. And unfortunately and tragically, they're at higher risk for esophageal cancers, esophageal strictures. It's not a benign condition. It's very, very common, but it is a condition that with lifestyle changes alone, by the way, weight loss is an important one. If someone is overweight, they are much more likely to have GERD. Also stay away from certain foods that tend to relax the lower esophageal sphincter. Fried foods in particular, onions, garlic, peppermints, um, different foods can also affect it. By the way, just as a little trivia point, chocolate also affects the lower esophageal sphincter. And do you know why restaurants tend to give people chocolate mints as they're leaving the restaurant? It's because aerophagia is universal. Aerophagia is air swallowing. With every single swallow, you swallow about five milliliters or five cubic centimeters of air. Air is basically nitrogen. It's a non-absorbable gas. During the course of a meal, you swallow a lot of air. You're going to be bloated and distended. You're going to be uncomfortable. Restaurateurs know this. They want you to come back. They don't want you to be uncomfortable. They offer you a chocolate mint. Chocolate and the mint, both, are known as carminatives. They relax the lower esophageal sphincter, which allows the air that you've swallowed to escape as a belch or a burp which is why they offer you the chocolate mint on your way out of the restaurant. They want you to burp and belch in your car on the way home with your significant other. They don't want you doing it in the restaurant. So trivia time, chocolate and mints are not to be consumed if you have GERD. It'll make your GERD worse. That's good to know. Linda, who's watching live, says she loves your voice. You should do an audio book. Yeah, it's very soothing, your voice. Thank you. It was very kind of you and her to say that. I appreciate that. I've been on radio. I've had a number of uh, TED type broadcasts, uh, Aspen, et cetera. But I've been thinking about a podcast. I have not done that yet. I don't know, AJ, would you be interested in helping me if we were to do something like that? Yeah, I, I, to my, the best of my ability. All right. Thanks, AJ. And thank you for the nice compliment. I appreciate that. Nice. Here's a question on colonoscopies from Dave. He wants to know, do you recommend that men over 50 still get one every 10 years? I'm a gastroenterologist. The official party line for my specialty is, of course, you should have a colonoscopy. You should have it even more often as starting at a younger age. I'm a contrarian. I don't accept the party line. In fact, I'm an outlier. I have written a book with Nancy and our daughter, Danielle, who is also a physician. She's internal medicine endocrinology. I won't plug the book at the moment, but it is important. What we take is a contrarian viewpoint of colonoscopy and colon cancer screening and prevention. We are advocates for colon cancer screening and prevention. It's important. However, for the average person who is not at higher risk, colonoscopy, it is our belief, is overmarketed overrated. As, it, a, as a screening as test, a screening but test. not as a diagnostic No, test. as a screening test for the average populations, there are safer ways to get screened for colon cancer, much less expensive, easier. So the fecal immunochemical test is available, much less expensive. Cologuard is a brand name product where they do the FIT test as well as the stool DNA test. There are blood tests now available to identify colon cancer screening again this is all screening for the average population 
colonoscopy has a higher risk, higher expense. I would not recommend it. If you're at higher risk, the party line is still to recommend it. And by higher risk, mean positive family history of colon cancer, past history of colon polyps, history of inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease for greater than eight years. If you have those risk factors, yes, colonoscopy is often recommended. Again, I'm a bit of a contrarian. I don't always recommend colonoscopy, but it is a good test when it comes to diagnosis. It is a good test for those that are at higher risk. There are better tests if you're at average risk. Do you remember a long time ago, a movie with Raquel Welch? I think it was called Fantastic Voyage, where like the people shrunk down yeah. and they went inside the body. Do you think one day, Dr. Joe, that it will, will have that technology? Because the thing about colonoscopy is most people don't enjoy the prep at all. And uh, it, like where we could just swallow a camera and then everything we need to know, we'll just poop it out and then you'll see what's going on. Well, guess what, Chef AJ? We're uh, here. Fantastic we Voyage arrived a number of years ago. There is what's called capsule colonoscopy, and it is available. It was developed by an Israeli company called Given Imaging, and it is popular. It's an alternative to the typical optical colonoscopy, which has a pretty difficult preparation to cleanse the colon through, and then you're looking inside with an invasive instrument. So capsule colonoscopy is less invasive. You still have to go through the prep. Uh, it is very, very accurate. The people in my field who argue against to say, well, if you do see a polyp, you can't do anything about it. You're going to need to have a regular colonoscopy afterwards. Anyhow, there's another side, and I don't want to take up too much of your program time with it, but there are disadvantages to optical colonoscopy. We don't see everything that we claim we're seeing. There's a lot that is not seen. And in women. Even. And particularly yeah. in women. And when it comes to capsule colonoscopy, it does have an advantage. Thankfully, you don't have to retrieve the capsule. It's disposable uh, and is typically covered by insurance. There is also virtual colonoscopy using CT or MRI as alternative imaging technology. Even better yet, the blood tests are even more sensitive more accurate than simply having a blood test drawn, uh, that will be replacing, I believe, colonoscopy for screening purposes. Liqu but we're, liquid biopsy. It's, it's called a liquid biopsy where they're looking for, again, we're talking about DNA in this program, is identifying cell-free DNA circulating in the blood from polyps and cancers. And there's a company that's based in San Diego that has now developed a test, blood test, that can identify over 50 different cancers on a simple blood test. Uh, it's not FDA approved yet, but it is commercially available and it's brilliant and it will become the standard of care in the years to come. That is fantastic because most, most doctors don't give patients the option. They want them to do a colonoscopy and then if they refuse, they'll ask them to do Cologuard. And here's the, the side that is really embarrassing to me. Most doctors don't know. And it's not that they're trying to be malicious. Most doctors really wanna help people. They really do care for people. But if you think about this, we went to medical school oftentimes years or decades ago. It's impossible to keep up with all the advances going on. So most doctors are behind. When a major advance occurs in medicine, even when they get the Nobel Prize for it, it takes 10 to 20 years before the doctors in the trenches are aware and advising patients to get the updated care. So you really have to be your own advocate. You have to do your own homework. Hopefully you can find a caregiver who is up to date or is willing to be open-minded about things, but things are changing fast, super fast. In fact, the understanding now is that knowledge in the life sciences, wisdom and knowledge, doubling every two to three months. That means half of what we thought we knew just three or four months ago has been disproven, replaced by new information. Do you think there's ever any value in people getting a sigmoidoscopy? Because that doesn't involve that kind of difficult prep, but it doesn't go up far enough, does it? Well, here's the trick. Sigmoidoscopy is useful, but only in men, not in women. And it is limited. It'll only see about one fourth of the colon. But in men, that's where most of the cancers occur, where most of the polyps occur. So in men, flexible sigmoidoscopy still has value. It's invasive, but less invasive. It has risk, but a lower risk. It has cost, but a lower cost. The prep is easier. It's just one or two brief enemas rather than having a whole colon purgative, mm -hmm. but it's not recommended for women, men only, and there are better ways to screen than flexible sigmoidoscopy. And right. then women are also told that we have tortuous colons because we have a smaller space to put all the all of the significant colon in there. And so it's harder to maneuver around all those tight curves. And so when 
a woman comes out of a colonoscopy, <laughs> very often they're told, my, you had such a tortuous colon, you were so tough. And sometimes not everything is seen as well as it should. Yeah. So it's easier to have a, a, a missed diagnosis or a missed polyp on a woman than in a man. Well, one of the things that Nancy and Danielle taught me, and I mentioned how there's a lot we don't know. I'm a gastroenterologist, I'm a professor. I should know all these things. They told me that women are different than men. I didn't quite understand that. <laughs> so we're apparently curvy on the outside and the inside. I was on actually told that and in my last colonoscopy, that. a torturous colon. That is very interesting. And I did notice that, that women are more challenging. I never thought anyone else recognized it as but well. You, but you did know it. I, I did know it from my own experience that women have more challenging colons, but no one ever told me that, never ever taught me that. When we did all the literature search for our book, and we spent a lot of time doing literature research on everything about colon cancer screening, if prevention, what I discovered from their knowledge was, indeed, the science is there. Women have a longer, narrower, more curvaceous, tortuous colon. And it's, a riskier procedure it, for It's women. more difficult to get around, which is why colonoscopy is higher risk in women. Complication rates are higher in women. The miss rate for colon polyps and colon cancer is higher in women. Another reason why in our book, it's called Got Guts, how to beat and prevent colon cancer, you can use other safer approaches than colonoscopy. Great, thank you. Somebody's asking, is Coleman's mustard powder okay? You know, I don't know. Maybe you know, Chef AJ, if it's not been pasteurized, it should be. So the mustard seed has myrosinase. So if it's raw mustard, raw mustard seed that has not been pasteurized, not been um, heated, then it should be okay. But the myrosinase enzyme is heat labile. That is, if it's overheated, it will become inactive. Great. Thank you. Melissa says, is there a certain amount of fiber you recommend we get daily? Typically would suggest about 25 grams of fiber a day. That may sound like a lot since most people get about 10 to 15 grams, but about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day would be beneficial. It's really hard to overdose on fiber. And again, these are just recommendations. I think you will find on your own that your bowel movements change as you increase the fiber content. The bowel movements become a bit bulkier, a little bit softer, easier to pass. So when you get to that point where you're saying that's a pretty full bowel movement and I'm comfortable, you've reached your saturation point for fiber. The other concern, some people say they get a little bit gassy, bloated, distended. That, often starts, but typically goes away as your body acclimatizes to the fiber content. Does it matter soluble versus insoluble? Or is I it would, all you good? should have both, you need both. Both have its value. That's fantastic. Let's see, I think I saw another question. This is fabulous, by the way, you're both fabulous. I'm so enjoying this. Oh, here's one. Um, I know how Dr. Clapper feels about this, but let's ask the two doctors, how do you guys feel about colonics? Um, open to them, excuse me for even saying that out loud, but I think it's reasonable. If you look at the history of medicine, colonics have been around for thousands of years. They were actually part of the standard armamentarium of Western medicine until about a hundred years ago when the pharmaceutical industry developed laxatives that took the place. So I think in moderation, everything is fine, including moderation in moderation. So if you're having a colonic once a week, no objection to that. Uh, if you go to a colon hydrotherapist, they are professional, they well, use and sterilize. They make sure that it is a good facility. Well, it is, I'm sure. If, if they're a colonic hydrotherapist, they are certified, it's sterile equipment, it's safe, uh, the risk is extraordinarily small. Um, I think it's fine, no harm there. If you start doing them every day, you're going to be wiping out your gut microbiome. By the way, a little trivia point, science finally believes it has figured out what the appendix is for. The belief now is that the purpose of the appendix is to save your gut microbiome. In case you have horrific diarrhea and your, your gut microbiome has been wiped out, there is a reservoir of microbes residing in your appendix which will repopulate your colon and your gut. So that is supposedly the purpose of the appendix. Science continues to make progress we finally have an answer. It's like the safe deposit box for yeah. your gut. Yes. Yeah, that so is so I, interesting because a lot of people get appendicitis and end up losing their appendix. They do. In fact, the latest is you may not need to have your appendix removed if you have appendicitis. The latest is now to treat it briefly with antibiotics and continue unless on with your happy it's appendix. Bursting. Well, if it's bursting, it's preferred that you don't have any choice. So by the way, colonics in moderation, no problem. Great. So there's a question if the Cologuard poop test can replace 
colonoscopies for most of us? For the average risk person, yes, it can. It is just as effective as colonoscopy for finding colon cancers. It is less effective than colonoscopy in finding polyps, but it is still very effective in finding polyps. If you do it routinely, every three years is the official recommendation. You can do it more often than that. Some people are recommending you do it every year. You will be about as safe from colon cancer as if you got colonoscopy. The only disadvantage of Cologar is that you basically have to send in a regular pool <laughs> stool specimen, if you would. Uh, they package it smartly, so it's actually done very nicely. They, they do a very good job with the preparation, but Cologar is a good test, but I would suggest to you, it probably will be replaced with the blood test coming up, the cell-free DNA. And again, Cologar is looking at DNA and feces. This will be looking at DNA and blood. It's gonna be even more sensitive, more accurate. They need to make a bigger bucket for us vegans because we poop <laughs> a lot more than the average American. <laughs> Nothing like fiber. Uh, well, speaking of fiber, uh, there's a question. Do you recommend psyllium husk for fiber? Psyllium husk is excellent. It's an excellent fiber. And yes, I do. So psyllium is called a hydrophilic <laughs> mucilloid. It's one of the most popular fibers. If you're looking at brands, it's one of the most commonly ones used. So uh, Metamucil and company. All of them have made the psyllium very, very popular. You don't have to pay for the brand name. You can get it uh, at Whole Foods, Costco, uh, nature stores, whatever. Psyllium husk is fine. Right. Well, God, you guys are just a wealth of information. I so enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Oh, our pleasure. Well, thank you, AJ, for inviting us. And thanks I, to the audience for wonderful questions, too. I do and, appreciate it. And I hope to see you both again at Rancho very soon. We'll look forward to it. Thank Definitely. you, AJ. Goodbye. And congratulations everybody. on becoming new grandparents. Hey, thank you. We're thank really you. excited. Thank you so they much. Say, as they say, mazel tov. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we start Longevity Week, when we are featuring prominent people who have been vegan 30, 40, 50 years and more in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, who are going to share with you the secret to timeless beauty and aging gracefully. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday.